Thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to talk to this distinguished uh, audience and address this uh, very important conference. Uh, like Katriona Kelly, um, I've been wondering how to frame uh, a keynote presentation and I've been worrying that uh, mine is kind of framed very narrowly but at the same time uh, the, the issues which I studied in relation to uh, the project that have been mentioned uh, in a way unfortunately are becoming more and more topical so I've uh, kind of decided to keep this narrow frame but uh, in, in a hope that the topicality of the issues will be of uh, interest to uh, this diverse audience. Um, and uh, again, uh, like uh, Professor Kelly, uh, uh, the, to the talk is uh, related to different ways in uh, which Russians uh, go about uh, contemporarily and to some extent historically coming up with the notions uh, of uh, collective identities. Um, now, uh, if one looks at the literature on uh, nationalism, theoretical literature, we see a lot of references to the importance of uh, the media and communication technologies uh, to the successes of uh, nation building. And, uh, in this context, it's uh, in a way surprising uh, that uh, there is not that much work specifically on uh, nationalism and uh, particular media. And uh, most of the work which exists tends to look at um, uh, the relationship between media and conflict, and less so um, um, on the issue between media and national cohesion. And when media are studied, uh, studied for actually uh, purely pragmatic reasons, usually print media or now internet are researched, and less so television. So the importance of television as a nation building tool is studied actually less than its societal importance warrants. And so um, my research in the last few years has been linked to attempt to uh, fill in this gap. Uh, now, uh, we uh, kind of know, uh, and particularly uh, in the context of the Ukraine crisis, we could see how much uh, Putin's regime has used television uh, as uh, a tool to uh, disseminate its message. And so scholars have argued that that actually kind of betrays the Russian regime outdated um, uh, understanding of, of communication technologies. But uh, again, here one shouldn't overemphasize the specificity of Russia. Television in uh, many uh, other contexts continues to play a very important role as a kind of nation-building tool. And that's because uh, in new technologies, very often, create, yes, indeed, strong group identities, but these uh, groups are much smaller than the nation. To some extent, new technologies fragment societies as much that, as they remind them. We uh, also, again, one has to justify why, why one looks these days at uh, kind of national identities rather than global or transnational ones, and for some time we've heard uh, scholars arguing um, that uh, we now live in post-national age. But uh, lately, right or so, this kind of uh, notion has been questioned because, um, in fact, not only Putin's regime, but uh, many governments react to globalization and unprecedented let's say, population flows, which um, it unleashed by fortifying the nation uh, with reference to kind of real or uh, perceived uh, security threats. And we know that um, from uh, the beginning of uh, this video, uh, the Russian government had at least uh, at the discursive level, the rhetorical level, put kind of nation building at the top of its agenda. But uh, in this um, uh, in, in this context, 
we have to ask the questions of who are and the actors in the construction of official discourse uh, in general, and certainly the official discourse of the nation in Putin's Russia. And uh, my interest in television um, uh, has drawn my attention to the importance of what uh, media sports called media events, and I'll explain uh, in a few moments what this term refers to. And uh, again, we could uh, think about how this uh, discourse of the nation has changed uh, in the last 10 years um, or so. And I'll make four interconnected points. Uh, because again, there is a tendency not just among uh, journalists, but also some scholars, to overemphasize the importance of the Kremlin, of the Putin, uh, in uh, articulating various narratives of nationhood. Uh, and uh, I would be uh, showing that the Kremlin um, is not the, the only actor, and uh, sometimes not even the most important actor. Uh, even though in the context of the Ukraine crisis, uh, its uh, role in uh, shaping the parameter of the debate has increased. Uh, and I've been interested uh, in, uh, for some time, in the role of so-called public intellectuals, and it might be a misnomer, uh, in a way these are people close to the Kremlin, we've uh, already mentioned their names here, like Rahana Kudugin, and also media personalities uh, like Kisilov, uh, of course, a moment of uh, Shevchenko. Um, Again, uh, the role of the kind of public and the interest of the government in the kind of public mood uh, is much greater than it used to be the case in the Soviet period and has to be factored uh, into it. And uh, for some time now, and certainly in the context of the Ukraine crisis, we have uh, seen a very significant ethnicization of the official discourse of the nation. In a way, it's a paradox that international media talk about uh, with some justification, of course, uh, of uh, Russian policy, Russian annexation of the Crimea as uh, an example of uh, Russian uh, neo-imperialism, but if you look at the discourse at home, it's all about the nation, it's nothing about the empire. And so, uh, it's interesting to see how this institutionalization of the official discourse of the nation is encouraged by this interaction between the Kremlin, the loyal intellectuals in the media, or also the readings by these groups of the public mood. Um, my uh, sources um, arise from a project, and I should mention that it is a collective project, which is uh, led by my colleague from the University of Manchester, Professor Stephen Hutchings, and myself, and we had a group of uh, researchers. Um, uh, who helped us to put together a massive archive of uh, news and political non-news programs um, broadcast by the two main Russian television channels, uh, Russia and Channel One. Uh, uh, Russia is a government-owned channel, Channel One is only partly state-owned, but uh, both are basically state library, we can say, the state control. Uh, channels. And why television, if you look at opinion polls, still over 70%, the largest group uh, of respondents, say that their main source of news are these two channels. So they have a massive impact on how um, Russians basically understand what's going on uh, in, the, uh, in the world. And uh, we specifically uh, identified, we, our researchers looked at all the news broadcasts and then uh, we uh, uh, developed a coding system uh, whereby uh, items related to ethnicity and nationalism uh, were archived and we could then uh, go back to this archive uh, to analyze um, our data. And um, so the uh, monitoring um, uh, took place between 2010 and 2014. Uh, and then we had a follow-up uh, funding where our researcher, Yuri Tepper, looked specifically at the coverage of the annexation of the uh, Crimea, and uh, again, these findings are coming out um, uh, in uh, the German post-Soviet affairs. 
Uh, I'll start by uh, saying uh, a couple of words on the period pre-2012, uh, uh, because this will be then see the start of the kind of really uh, very new developments uh, to a large extent, and then I'll focus in more detail um, on Putin's third presidential term. Uh, so if we look at uh, this earlier period, um, so broadly speaking, this is a time of uh, Sukhov's managed pluralism, and actually we were surprised to see uh, a greater diversity of views represented by one way or the other on uh, these two channels than we had anticipated, uh, even though very often this kind of pluralism is clearly very staged. Uh, and uh, he was already kind of stirred into the kind of uh, understanding that this position is, from the point of view of the regime is more acceptable than that. But it's still sort of managed uh, uh, pluralism. Uh, already the government was talking about the importance of uh, maintaining ethnic cohesion and creating a compound identity for the people of Russia, but this was not reflected in the pattern of news coverage. Uh, because the relevant views uh, were um, constitute a very small percentage of the overall um, broadcasting uh, frequency. Here it's sort of between six and eight percent frequency it means the number of items from the overall um, number of news and the intensity is amount of time uh, devoted and. Um, that, of course, quite a significant proportion, particularly in relation to controversial issues such as uh, uh, sensitive issues such as uh, violent conflict or migration, quite a lot of new developments outside uh, Russia. So it's clear that to show that uh, if Russia has problems, it's not kind of unique or specific to the country. Uh, and. Uh, there was a deliberate kind of ambiguity about the discourse of the nation. On the, other, on the one hand, uh, it was represented as um, um, Russia was represented as a multi ethnic society, a multi ethnic, multi confession, multi cultural, and that was its strength. Uh, you have here a um, uh, quote from uh, Maxim Shevchenko, who we interviewed in 2011. Now, I give the names of uh, these people who we interviewed. Uh, they were actually very happy with us citing them uh, by, uh, by name. And uh, in a way, the quotes I present here, they were uncontroversial, but some things they said were quite sensitive, and it's again an difference, interesting difference with the Soviet times that uh, the celebrity journalists were not at all afraid to kind of speak their minds when talking to foreign researchers. Uh, and uh, I mean, again, I refer to Kachmona's talk, and she's absolutely right that here uh, the celebration of multi ethnicity of uh, uh, Russia uh, reflects uh, a kind of idealization of their uh, imperial experience, and that's a difficulty of formulating transnational identity or even national identity, uh, which uh, is uh, could be made outside the sort of former imperial context. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there, is, uh, there was a kind of strong perception on the part uh, of uh, those in charge uh, of the television coverage that ultimately public opinion has to be taken into account and uh, so these broadcasters were quite uh, sensitive to the fact that uh, the message of Russian ethnic nationalists uh, who kind of argued that even the current Putin's regime had discriminated against the Russian ethnic Russians and favored minorities that this message has to be kind of heard. Um, and um, so uh, within this context, so there was an emphasis on the importance of Russian culture uh, and of course the state, but also culture uh, as a glue which brings all these different nationalities together. And the overall pattern of coverage was very similar to what then Putin presented in his uh, election manifesto article of January 2012, 
where if you talk to her about Russia's multi-ethnicity strength, the importance of Russian culture, bringing all these different ethnic groups together, and also uh, central to this coverage was just a juxtaposition between the positive experience of Russia for managing multi-ethnicity and the failure uh, of multicultural model uh, in the West, which was uh, claimed to be sort of hypocritical and uh, not um, working. Uh, the, the situation changed very significantly post uh, uh, election, the election of Putin to third presidential term, and uh, previous demonstrations against, in a way, so uh, um, virtual, uh, virtual politics and uh, managed pluralism. And uh, the, the government uh, decided that there was a need to mobilize the population in kind of different ways, and television also responded by starting to develop new strategies. More time started to be dedicated to the discussion of issues of uh, ethnic cohesion, and uh, it was uh, clear to us, and to some extent confirmed by uh, the people we interviewed, uh, that television uh, channels, the two main channels, were in a way given a task to co-opt uh, uh, more overtly uh, the message of uh, Russian ethno-nationalists. So less celebration of ethnic diversity and more uh, kind of celebration of the ethnic Russian component of um, the nation. And I would say that, uh, again, it's uh, um, a broad kind of, uh, of course, simplifying the situation. Uh, during the third uh, presidency of uh, Vladimir Putin, there was some repackaging of uh, narratives of nationhood. Uh, not new narratives, but in fact, repackaging with new, new um, emphasis being put. And uh, this image of uh, shaped by isolationist Russian nationalism, which uh, wants to expel the kind of ethnic other from the national body, which Putin uh, uh, explicitly criticized uh, in his article, now started to um, kind of appear uh, in television news much more than uh, 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 before. Uh, at the same time, the Kremlin continued to talk about Russia as the center of the Eurasian Union, Union and the, this Eurasian space is supposed to be uh, based on the history of interaction, peaceful interaction between Christianity and Islam. And of course, we already heard that a new narrative about Russia's traditional values um, had emerged, and it's in the context where the regime felt that a clear articulation of consensual values was necessary. And so the ambiguity of the official discourse cultivated by Sukhov uh, didn't pay off in a way. And uh, here is a quote from Dmitry Kisilov. I don't need to explain the, the, who he is to this audience. Uh, and he was very emphatic about the the aid, his own agency and sort of the importance of uh, the role of uh, journalists like him in the kind of producing narratives which are then pointed in the um, official um, discourse. And I, I wonder that he is talking about the need to colonize our own country, whether he um, read uh, Alexander Etkin's work. Um, so what do we see in the period since the beginning of 2012? It's a, a new management of uh, television coverage. Uh, the coverage where the so-called media event plays a very prominent role. Now, media event is a term which uh, was coined by uh, two uh, media studies scholars back in the early 1990s, the young cats, uh, and uh, they describe uh, the television coverage of events where the kind of uh, this coverage is absolutely central to. Uh, how 
the event unfolds. And the coverage brings in uh, viewers as an active participant in the events. So it has to be uh, sort of oversaturated or saturated coverage to have endless reporting on television around the same event. Uh, there is always high drama and there is a kind of hero or anti-hero present and hero or hero to be a personal group. Um, the Yemen Press are, uh, argued that all media events were pre-planned, uh, but then um, uh, later media studies scholars kind of uh, adapted uh, this uh, term to a broader range of events, not necessarily uh, pre-planned. And I would argue this uh, notion is very important to understanding how uh, television uh, strategy developed post-1992. Uh, and it uh, really s sort of was organized through very well orchestrated and uh, media campaigns in which media events were kind of central. And again, we can make historical comparisons with the Soviet period where political changes, political shifts were always, always involved in the media. Let's say Pravda editorial would signal uh, an attack on a particular kind of group uh, of um, people in Stalin's period and later. But again, it's the role of the media is very different. The agency of uh, journalists today is much greater than what it used to be in the past. So uh, I'll look now briefly at three uh, media events which had a very significant impact on the kind of reshaping of the discourse of the nation. Uh, the first is the Pussy Riot Affair, and then uh, anti-immigration campaign of 2012 and 2013, and then in a way the annexation of the Crimea was a television campaign um, as well. Uh, the Pussy Riot Affair was a media event par excellence, uh, even though we made a decision uh, to um, arrest um, the members of the PAN group. was taken at the very top of the political establishment. Uh, the uh, event took its particular form through television coverage, uh, and it's the television coverage that made this ultimately insignificant affair of the kind which had been ignored before, it turned it into a, you could say, a limit event. It, it was presented as the event which undermined or tried even to destroy the very moral foundation of uh, Russian society. And in the course of so endless months of saturated coverage, you, one could see a very clear shift in uh, official discourse because television ultimately, the, uh, uh, the two uh, main television channels, uh, they are very important agents in the production of official discourse. So, uh, Orthodox Christianity became not a part of Russia, an important component of Russian identity, but the core uh, of identity of the Russian people. Uh, the narrative about Russia as a bastion of traditional values, again, it crystallizes very clearly in the course of that campaign. Um, with the um, and one can look uh, at the programs, provocatory, that some of you have um, uh, probably uh, seen these programs, uh, broadcast by a CH channel and uh, they were made by uh, Arkady Mamontov. Um, notorious journalist who is even kind of controversial by the, standard, by the standards of today's Russian media establishment. And uh, his programs uh, started by moment of asking the audience of the talk show, asking the audience who are we, and every program uh, repeated the same answer, we are orthodox. Uh, and again, this discourse of uh, traditional values developed. Uh, the, um, the way uh, the Putin regime tried to uh, manage society through polarization uh, kind of in a way radicalized uh, during uh, this campaign. 
And uh, again, something we could see already going back to the, mid, uh, um, the middle of the first decade of the 21st century, uh, it's to um, kind of structure the discussion through very sharp binary oppositions, uh, apocalyptical images of the society in moral crisis, uh, on the verge of collapse, uh, and uh, also a very extensive use of conspiracy theories to explain what ha what's happening in Russia and uh, in the world. In the course of this campaign, the kind of discourse of the nation became more univocal. It's very clear that the kind of multi-ethnic um, ideal was pushed to the background. Instead, um, the kind of ethnic um, vision of uh, the nation was um, prioritized, and it had very direct influence on how kind of, other traditional, again, official term religions of Russia were represented. And uh, anyway, our archives show that Buddhism and Judaism to uh, other uh, traditional religions were not covered at all anyway. But Islam was uh, very, uh, kind of, quite extensively covered the Islam-related issues on television, and the coverage on the whole was positive. And in fact, if one can, could signal, uh, single out one particular program, which would um, um, kind of reenact uh, Kremlin's ideal of the multi-ethnic nation, there would be a program on Sulmani, uh, which talked about this constantly coexistence between Islam and Christianity in um, Russia. But already during the Fusi Riot campaign, there were some very negative representations of Islam here and there. And then this um, further attack on Islam took place um, within the next campaign, which started in uh, the spring of 2012 and finished in the fall of 2013. There was again a concerted campaign uh, against migration. Uh, this campaign clearly was an attempt to cater to kind of public mood, and opinion polls showed growing xenophobia uh, in Russian negative attitudes, increasingly negative attitudes towards migrants from um, uh, Central Asia and the Caucasus, and also what uh, Russian media and official officials uh, call internal migrants, and that's people from the North Caucasus. Uh, in this campaign, uh, the Muslim migrant emerged as a Russian main other in television coverage. Uh, and interesting, a very different image of Islam constructed compared to earlier periods. It's a negative image, although the campaign was supposedly targeting a radical Islam, it was called radical Islam, but in fact the line between radical and, and Islam in general was blurred. And particularly uh, when uh, the riots in Stockholm in May 2013, and also the murder in um, London of a British soldier by um, Islamist radicals, put turned into media events by Russian television. And there, there was a talk about Islam in general and incompatibility between. Uh, values of Islam and European values, uh, that is, values of Christianity. Uh, a similar kind of binary opposition was created, and uh, Kisilov was to large extent responsible for that in the coverage of uh, the relationship between the Slavic population or indigenous population, a very learned term, in the Stavropol pride of Russia. And uh, multiple occasions. <coughs> and this is uh, the program which is of edited at the time, based on Gary, um, um, covered what the program called the invasion of uh, North Caucasians uh, into the predominantly Slavic um, region. And that was again managed as a uh, media event. And here what's interesting is a contribution of different actors in the construction of official discourse. Because the Kremlin pronouncements during this campaign were very different from those of uh, um, television reporters and celebrity journalists. 
the Kremlin continued to talk about migration as necessary for Russian economy, uh, and uh, occasionally referred to uh, people from Central Asia as our uh, former compatriots. Momentum broadcasting, another series of programs about uh, uh, migrants from Central Asia, and they, uh, the program was pointedly called Aliens. So, uh, scientists being compatriots versus uh, aliens. And we asked, uh, in our interviews, we asked um, uh, reporters, uh, Russian uh, reporters, uh, about this clear difference between uh, television pronouncements and uh, Putin's statement. And one of the liberally inclined journalists said, oh, the Kremlin created puppets uh, who they no longer can control. But uh, of course, it doesn't seem to be, to me, to be as simple as that. Uh, the puppets clearly uh, worked within the kind of uh, framework, um, which uh, was determined uh, in by the Kremlin, and that's the framework of managing society by kind of uh, channeling negative attitudes towards specific groups uh, and uh, sort of targeting a migrant in a way was a very um, easy populist tactics, which would suggest that uh, to an average viewer that the government is responsive to the public mood without. Uh, top officials having to make inflammatory pronouncements which could be offensive to particular citizens of the Russian Federation or the residents of, uh, of uh, the country. And so then the final um, kind of case is the annexation of the Crimea. Yeah, you had saturated coverage, it's symbolic uh, coverage where celebrations uh, to mark uh, that, uh, that session, so it wasn't called as such, uh, in Moscow and Simferopol were shown side by side. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, the, 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 the way the discussion was framed on uh, Russian television, in some ways uh, it was unexpected. There was nothing about uh, the state, it was nothing about the redrawing of state border. It was all kind of done, represented in the name of the nation, uh, the unification of the divided uh, Russian nation. And the word uh, Rasiski was almost never used in the coverage. It was all about Ruski, so the ethnic uh, term uh, for Russian. Uh, and uh, the residents of the Crimea uh, were even rarely called Satyajitsky. They were Ruski. Uh, also Ruski were uh, the residents of eastern Ukraine. And that is, again, an interesting shift from uh, 2004, during the Orange Revolution, uh, the, uh, the Russian media represented eastern Ukrainians, the residents of the Crimea, as Ukrainians who had their own version of Ukrainian identity and history, which was different from a uh, version of, let's say, of Western Ukrainian, but equally valid. Now, the same people were represented as Ruski, who uh, Ukrainian fascists tried to deprive from their memory, history, and language. So very different representation from uh, uh, ten years uh, earlier. Now again, we saw interesting differences between the Kremlin's pronouncements and television reporting. Uh, Putin, uh, in his 18 March speech 2014, uh, mentioned the word Ruski 26 times, and that was unprecedented. At the same time, his representation of uh, Russia and the Crimea were in line with this kind of uh, near-imperial version of Russian identity. He spoke about um, multi-ethnic, multicultural society, Crimea kind of representing uh, being a microcosm of Russia's multi-ethnicity, and he talked about Russia as a country where for hundreds of years not a single ethnic group disappeared. So um, this, of course, Russia as an empire. 
And about Ukrainians, he uh, again made contradictory remarks. On the one hand, he claimed that uh, you, uh, he respected Ukrainian tradition, Ukrainian uh, culture, and kind of the uh, entitlement to have their separate identity. Uh, at the same time, he repeated uh, his statement of uh, September 2013, which he first made in September 2013, an extraordinary statement that Russians and Ukrainians were one people. Uh, so we can say that um, uh, the Kremlin, even in this situation, continued to kind of articulate an ambiguous discourse of the Russian nation, where the boundaries uh, of the nation were shifting, so it didn't kind of, uh, the Kremlin still refrained from, uh, de the, from defining the membership of the nation very precisely. Not so on television, Ukrainians were systematically in Ukraine presented as sort of Russia's main other, and uh, the discourse of the nation was extremely uh, ethnicized to the extreme, and the kind of vision of multi ethnic Russia very rarely appeared, or did it be contrasted with what was represented as mono ethnic uh, Ukrainian um, view of identity. Uh, so the boundaries of the nation were set very tightly in uh, the television coverage. So in a way, discrepancy uh, became quite pronounced. So to conclude, so I would say that uh, this journalist, and particularly celebrity journalist, uh, should be seen as very important agents in the production of uh, official discourses, certainly the narratives of nationhood. And to some extent, paradoxically, during uh, Putin's third uh, presidential term, their responsibility, doesn't mean independence, but responsibility for the production of official discourse, it increased compared to uh, the earlier period. Um, the um, uh, uh, media events uh, became a kind of very important tool uh, uh, manufacturing these media events became a very important tool uh, of uh, kind of disseminating uh, the regime's uh, message and uh, the, uh, the tel television particularly is pronounced in the case uh, of Channel One uh, the, uh, their kind of narratives have become much more populist than before, uh, exploiting uh, very overtly popular prejudices against migrants, against Islam, against uh, minorities. And we uh, see this ethnicization uh, of the discourse of the nation, but at the same time, as I've just said, there is a difference between uh, state-controlled television uh, trying to identify uh, the membership of the nation very precisely, and the Kremlin still uh, kind of keeping certain ambiguity in its pronouncements about uh, Russian uh, identity and community. Thank you.